Section One of the House of the Vampire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick. Chapter One. The freakish little leader of the orchestra, newly imported from Sicily to New York tossed his conductor's wand excitedly through the air, drowning with musical thunders the hum of conversation and the clatter of plates. Yet neither his apish demeanour nor the deafening noises that responded to every movement of his agile body detracted attention from the figure of Reginald Clark and the young man at his side as they smilingly wound their way to the exit. The boy's expression was pleasant, with an inkling of wistfulness while the soft glimmer of his lucid eyes betrayed the poet and the dreamer. The smile of Reginald Clark was the smile of a conqueror. A suspicion of silver in his crown of dark hair only added dignity to his bearing, while the infinitely ramified lines above the heavy-set mouth spoke at once of subtlety and of strength. Without stretch of the imagination, one might have likened him to a Roman cardinal in the days of the Borgias, who had miraculously stepped forth from a time-stained canvas and slipped into twentieth-century evening clothes. With the affability of complete self-possession, he nodded in response to greetings from all sides, inclining his head with special politeness to a young woman whose sea-blue eyes were riveted upon his features with a look of mingled hate and admiration. The woman, disregarding his silent salutation, continued to stare at him wild-eyed, as a damned soul in purgatory might look at Satan, passing in regal splendour through the seventy times sevenfold circles of hell. Reginald Clark walked on unconcernedly through the rows of gay diners, still smiling, affable, calm. But his companion bethought himself of certain rumours he had heard concerning Ethel Brandenburg's mad love for the man, from whose features she could not even now turn her eyes. Evidently her passion was unreciprocated. It had not always been so. There was a time in her career, some years ago in Paris, when it was whispered that she had secretly married him, and not much later, obtained a divorce. The matter was never cleared up, as both preserved an uncompromising silence upon the subject of their matrimonial experience. Certain it was that, for a space, the genius of Reginald Clark had completely dominated her brush, and that, ever since he had thrown her aside, her pictures were but plagiarisms of her former artistic self. The cause of the rupture between them was a matter only of surmise, but the effect it had on the woman testified clearly to the remarkable power of Reginald Clark. He had entered her life, and behold, the world was transfixed on her canvases in myriad hues of transcending radiance. He had passed from it, and with him vanished the brilliancy of her colouring, as at sunset the borrowed amber and gold fade from the face of the clouds. The glamour of Clark's name may have partly explained the secret of his charm, but even in circles where literary fame is no passport, he could, if he chose, exercise an almost terrible fascination. Subtle and profound, he had ransacked the coffers of medieval dialecticians, and plundered the arsenals of the sophists. Many years later, when the vultures of misfortune had swooped down upon him, and his name was no longer mentioned without a sneer, he was still remembered in New York drawing-rooms as the man who had brought to perfection the art of talking. Even to dine with him was a liberal education. Clark's marvellous conversational power was equalled only by his marvellous style. Ernest Fielding's heart leaped in him with the thought that henceforth he would be privileged to live under one roof with the only writer of his generation who could lend to the English language the rich strength and rugged music of the Elizabethans. Reginald Clark was a master of many instruments. Milton's mighty organ was no less obedient to his touch than the little lute of the troubadour. He was never the same. That was his strength. Clark's style possessed at once the chiselled chasteness of a Greek marble column, and the elaborate deviltry of the late Renaissance. At times his winged words seemed to flutter down the page frantically like Baroque angels. At other times nothing could have more adequately described his manner than the timeless calm of the gaunt pyramids. The two men had reached the street. Reginald wrapped his long spring coat round him. "'I shall expect you to-morrow, at four, he said. The tone of his voice was deep and melodious, suggesting hidden depths and cadences. 
I shall be punctual." The younger man's voice trembled as he spoke. "'I look forward to your coming with much pleasure. I am interested in you." The glad blood mounted to Ernest's cheeks at praise from the austere lips of this arbiter of literary elegance. An almost imperceptible smile crept over the other man's features. "'I am proud that my work interests you,' was all the boy could say. "'I think it is quite amazing. But at present—' Here Clark drew out a watch set with jewels. I am afraid I must bid you good-bye." He held Ernest's hand for a moment in a firm, genial grasp, then turned away briskly, while the boy remained standing open-mouthed. The crowd jostling against him carried him almost off his feet, but his eyes followed far into the night the masterful figure of Reginald Clark, toward whom he felt himself drawn with every fibre of his body and the warm enthusiasm of his generous youth. Chapter Two. With elastic step, inhaling the night air with voluptuous delight, Reginald Clark made his way down Broadway, lying stretched out before him, bathed in light and pulsating with life. His world-embracing intellect was powerfully attracted by the giant city's motley activities. On the street, as in the salon, his magnetic power compelled recognition, and he stepped through the mist of the crowd as a Circassian blade cleaves water. After walking a block or two, he suddenly halted before a jeweller's shop. Arrayed in the window were priceless gems that shone in the glare of electricity like mystical serpent eyes, green, pomegranate, and water-blue. And as he stood there the dazzling radiance before him was transformed in the prism of his mind into something great and very wonderful, that might some day be a poem. Then his attention was diverted by a small group of tiny girls dancing on the sidewalk to the husky strains of an old hurdy-gurdy. He joined the circle of amused spectators, to watch those pink-ribboned bits of femininity swaying airily to and fro in unison with the tune. One especially attracted his notice, a slim, olive-coloured girl from a land where it is always spring. Her whole being translated into music, with hair dishevelled and feet hardly touching the ground, the girl suggested an orange-leaf dancing on a sunbeam. The rasping street-organ, perchance, brought to her melodious reminiscences of some flute-playing Savoyard boy, brown-limbed and dark of hair. For several minutes Reginald Clark followed with keen delight each delicate curve her graceful limbs described. Then, was it that she grew tired, or that the stranger's persistent scrutiny embarrassed her, the music oozed out of her movements. They grew slower, angular, almost clumsy. The look of interest in Clark's eyes died, but his whole form quivered, as if the rhythm of the music and the dance had mysteriously entered into his blood. He continued his stroll, seemingly without aim. In reality he followed, with nervous intensity, the multiform undulations of the populace, swarming through Broadway in either direction. Like the giant whose strength was rekindled every time he touched his mother, the earth, Reginald Clark seemed to draw fresh vitality from every contact with life. He turned east along Fourteenth Street, where cheap vaudevilles are strung together as glass pearls on the throat of a wanton. Gaudy billboards, drenched in clamorous red, proclaimed the tawdry attractions within. Much to the surprise of the doorkeeper at a particularly evil-looking music-hall, Reginald Clark lingered in the lobby and finally even bought a ticket that entitled him to enter this sordid wilderness of décolleté art. Street snipes, a few working men, dilapidated sportsmen and women whose ruined youth thick layers of powder and paint, even in this artificial light, could not restore, constituted the bulk of the audience. Reginald Clark, apparently unconscious of the curiosity, surprise, and envy that his appearance excited, seated himself at a table near the stage ordering from the solicitous waiter only a cocktail and a programme. The drink he left untouched, while his eyes greedily ran down the lines of the announcement. When he had found what he sought, he lit a cigar, paying no attention to the boards, but studying the audience with cursory interest, until the appearance of Betsy, the hyacinth girl. When she began to sing, his mind still wandered. The words of her song were crude, but not without a certain lilt that delighted the uncultured ear while the girl's voice was thin to the point of being unpleasant. When, however, she came to the burden of the song, Clark's manner changed suddenly. Laying down his cigar, he listened with rapt attention, eagerly gazing at her. 
for as she sang the last line and tore the hyacinth blossoms from her hair, there crept into her voice a strangely poignant, pathetic little trill, that redeemed the execrable faultiness of her singing, and brought the rude audience under her spell. Clark, too, was captivated by that tremor, the infinite sadness of which suggested the plaint of souls moaning low at night, when lust preys on creatures marked for its spoil. The singer paused. Still those luminous eyes were upon her. She grew nervous. It was only with tremendous difficulty that she reached the refrain. As she sang the opening lines of the last stanza, an inscrutable smile curled on Clark's lips. She noticed the man's relentless gaze and faltered. When the burden came, her singing was hard and cracked. The tremor had gone from her voice. End of section 1